subscribe, stay up to date. Episodes drop every other Monday. Welcome to the Matt Watch That Podcast, the place for reviews, rants, and randomness. I'm your host, Matt Sarosky, filmmaker, film fan. Each episode, I'm going to watch a movie or TV pilot that I probably should have seen but never got around to. It could be a recent favorite, critic's choice, or cult classic. To join in on the conversation, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed or suggestions as to what I should see next, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Before we start, it's time to bring back everyone's favorite segment, Box Office Breakdown. We should really get a stinger for that. Now normally, I take a look at the box office grosses in a specific month of a specific year, but this week... Since I'm reviewing a show from 1970, I wanted to get a little more context of what was going on at that time, so I decided to look up the top grossing films in 1970. And some of them might surprise you. Now, I'm going to fully admit, I normally do this off the cuff, give you my gut reaction to a film, but the truth is, while I've heard of all of these, I've only seen a couple. So I really can't give my opinion, but I'll give you a couple of facts. So these are the top grossing films of 1970. At number 10, Catch-22, directed by Mike Nichols, starring some big names, Alan Arkin, Bob Balaban, Martin Balsam, Norman Fell, Charles Grodin, Bob Newhart, John Voight, Martin Sheen, and Orson Welles. It also randomly includes singer Art Garfunkel as a pilot. Number 9, Tora Tora Tora, about the attack on Pearl Harbor. Another movie featuring the talent of Martin Balsam, alongside Joseph Cotton. Number 8, Ryan's Daughter, the romance drama set around the time of the Easter Rising in Ireland, with Robert Mitchum. Number 7, Little Big Man, director Arthur Penn reteams with Faye Dunaway. It also stars Dustin Hoffman and the MVP of 1970, Martin Balsam. Number 6, Woodstock. The documentary featuring footage from the three-day festival of peace and music. Number five, The Aristocats. The animated movie with the voices of Phil Harris, Ava Gabor, Sterling Hollowell, and Scatman Carruthers. It was the last feature that Walt Disney approved. Number four, Patton. Back to War Movies. Winner of seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture. Number three, M.A.S.H. It's almost like there was something going on at that time that inspired all these war movies. Anyway, classic movie, even more classic series. Number two, Airport. The disaster movie starring Dean Martin and Burt Lancaster, which paved the way for Towering Inferno, Earthquake, and the Poseidon Adventure. And at number one, Love Story. Yeah, that kind of came out of left field. The Opposites Attract, a romantic drama with Ryan O'Neill and Ally McGraw. Now, my earliest memory of this movie was even before I had seen it. You see, my grandparents had this music box in their living room that when you opened it, it would play the theme of Love Story. So that song is just embedded in my memory. And of course, I had to see the movie. You know, when I was old enough to understand the themes. But when was the last time a romantic movie was the highest grossing film of the year? Alphonse, Alphonse, look that up for me. It earned over $106 million. Adjusted for inflation, it'd probably be around $970 million. Something like that. I might be off a of scotch. But there you have it. The top grossing films of 1970. <laughs> On to the main attraction, folks. Each review will end with a ranking out of five stars. One star is Skip It. Two stars Watch at Your Own Risk. Three stars Standard Fare. Four stars Worth Checking Out. And five stars Must See. Now, if I give a title five stars, you know the deal. It doesn't mean I'm comparing it to Casablanca, Jaws, or Seinfeld. I rank titles based on other movies or TV series in that genre and at that time period. On this episode of the podcast, I'll be reviewing... The Mary Tyler Moore Show, 
from 1970. Co-created by James L. Brooks, three-time Oscar winner for Terms of Endearment, and writer of multiple TV series, and Alan Burns, screenwriter of A Little Romance, and formatted The Munsters. The pair met on the series My Mother the Car. Yes, apparently that was considered entertainment. The pilot episode, Love is All Around, was directed by Jay Sandrich, who helmed episodes of He and She, Get Smart, Here's Lucy, The Bob Newhart Show, and won four Primetime Emmy Awards for Outstanding Directing in a Comedy Series between The Mary Tyler Moore Show and The Cosby Show. The screenplay was co-written by the co-creators James L. Brooks and Alan Burns. It stars Mary Tyler Moore as Mary Richards. Born in Brooklyn, New York, her family moved west to Los Angeles when she was eight years old. Her first acting gig was in commercials for Hot Point Appliances, which aired during The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. She was cast as a secretary in Richard Diamond, Private Detective, for ten episodes. She would make the rounds on the television circuit, having appeared in Johnny Staccato, 77 Sunset Strip, The Tab Hunter Show, Riverboat, and The Danny Kay Show. It was on his recommendation that Mary Tyler Moore was cast in The Dick Van Dyke Show as Laura Petrie. The series ran for five seasons, 158 episodes. She appeared in a couple of movies, including Thoroughly Modern Millie and Change of Habit, before going back to the small screen in The Mary Tyler Moore Show. The all-star cast is rounded out by Gavin McLeod, Edward Asner, and Ted Knight. Believe it or not, Betty White was only in 45 episodes, despite playing the memorable character of Sue Ann Nibbins. She won seven Primetime Emmy Awards for her work on The Dick Van Dyke Show, The Mary Tyler Moore Show, and the TV movie Stolen Babies. She was nominated for Best Actress in a Leading Role Academy Award for Ordinary People in 1981. This is something to look out for. Keep those eyes peeled for a cameo from the creators, as joggers who run past Mary in the opening credits. So let's jump into it. Mary Richards is starting a new life for herself in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She's gotten out of a long-term relationship where she supported a man named Bill through his internship and residency at a hospital, with the promise that once his practice was up and running, they would be married. But two years later, he reneged on the commitment, asking, why rush things? She left him for brighter pastures, or wintry pastures, in the Twin Cities. Her new beginning is off to a rough start when the apartment she was promised by her best friend Phyllis is being squatted by a brash bulldozer, Rhoda Morgenstern. During her interview for a secretary position at WJM-TV, Mr. Grant drinks and asks her personal questions, which Mary answers with spunk. Though the job has already been filled, he offers her a position as associate producer, which she gladly accepts. While things are starting to look up, Phyllis received a long-distance call from Mary's ex-boyfriend. Bill is coming into town to visit. An old flame, a new job. Will she make it after all? Here's a quote without context. If I don't like you, I'll fire you. If you don't like me, I'll fire you. The Mary Tyler Moore Show had a very solid pilot. It's not easy to relay her backstory, introduce all these characters, and make it funny, but James L. Brooks and Alan Burns masterfully weave the storylines into an entertaining plot. It's slightly dated, not surprising. There were a couple of references that went over my head, but not enough to distract. The way that Mr. Grant interviewed Mary for the position is straight out of HR's What Not To Do playbook. In the hands of less capable actors, it would come across as awkward and uncomfortable, but Ed Asner and Mary Tyler Moore pull off the scene favorably. Ted Baxter, portrayed by Ted Knight, had a brief yet memorable appearance. It was enough to make me want to watch more for his character. Rhoda, played by Valerie Harper, could have been unlikable, but between the writing and performance, you could tell there was something underneath that gruff exterior. Phyllis and Murray, acted by Cloris Leachman and Gavin McLeod, respectively, were pretty unmemorable. It'll be interesting to see how their characters develop, especially with some gifted actors. Now for a little trivial trivia. Gavin McLeod was originally up for the part of Lou Grant, but preferred the role of Murray Slaughter. The cinematography was captured by Paul Ohl, whose filmography includes the Mary Tyler Moore spin-off, Rhoda, and The Bob Newhart Show. He was also camera assistant on The Man Who Knew Too Much, Vertigo, and King Creole. It was edited by Douglas Hines, who worked on the series Mr. Ed, The Beverly Hillbillies, The Addams Family, and Cheers. He won four Primetime Emmy Awards for The Mary Tyler Moore Show and The Tracy Ullman Show. 
The score was composed by Patrick Williams, who wrote the music for the series The Bob Newhart Show, and features Used Cars, Some Kind of Hero, Best Defense, Cry Baby, and was nominated in 1980 for Best Music, Original Song Score, and its Adaptation or Best Adaptation Score for Breaking Away. Can someone explain that category to me? Alphonse! Alphonse! Look that up for me. The theme song, Love is All Around, was written and performed by Sonny Curtis. His best-known pop composition was I Fought the Law, which has been covered most notably by The Clash. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2012 as part of the Crickets. The runtime is 25 minutes. On the Ski Index, I give it 4 out of 5 stars. The Mary Tyler Moore Show was on for seven seasons, 168 episodes, from 1970 to 1977. It was nominated for 82 Primetime Emmy Awards, winning 45 and honored with a Peabody Award in 1977. The show consistently ranks on best-of lists of various publications. It launched three spin-offs: Rhoda, Phyllis, and Lou Grant. If you've seen The Mary Tyler Moore Show and have opinions on the series, let me know what you think using the hashtag MattWatchThat. Moving right along, each episode, I'm going to post clips that I think people should watch. It could be movie trailers, music videos, interviews, or something completely random. Search for my YouTube page and there will be a playlist called Matt Watch That Playback. Steve Smith is best known for his time as drummer of the band Journey. He joined the pop rockers in 1979 and played on their biggest hits, including Loving, Touchin', Squeezin', Any Way You Want It, Lights, Who's Cryin' Now, Don't Stop Believin', Open Arms, Separate Ways, and Faithfully. He left in 1985 but would return for Journey's comeback album, Trial by Fire, in 1996, which included When You Love a Woman, which reached number 12 on the Billboard Hot 100. He would leave again in 1998 and re-return for a brief stint from 2015 to 2020. As a session musician, he worked for Brian Adams, Mariah Carey, Zuccaro, Savage Garden, and Andrea Bocelli. Inspired by Buddy Rich, Steve played big band music throughout high school and college and formed his own jazz group, Vital Information, in 1977. In 2002, he was voted into the Modern Drummer Hall of Fame, and 15 years later, as a member of Journey, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I've selected two videos where he breaks down his iconic drumming on the song Separate Ways and Don't Stop Believin'. What you'll notice is that he uses the open hand technique, which is a method where drummers don't cross their hands while playing the hi-hat and snare. It's fairly common practice when you first start playing, but most drummers will move on to the standard technique that we've all seen. He's also one of the most calm drummers I've ever watched. Not a lot of movement, straightforward drumming, doesn't mean it's simplistic. I think he picks the fills that fit the song. He definitely doesn't overplay. These clips are available in the Matt Watch That Playback playlist on YouTube. Check it out. Now it's time for the recommendation. Yes, that's the word recommendation with Matt in the middle. I'm going to end each podcast with my own recommendation of a movie or TV series. Today I'm talking about Poker Face. Created by Ryan Johnson, the writer-director of Knives Out, its sequel, Glass Onion, Star Wars, The Last Jedi, and the independent film Brick. It tells the story of Charlie Kale, a waitress at the Sterling Frost Casino and Hotel, who has the uncanny ability to read people's p-p-p-p-poker face. After solving a murder, she ends up going on the run in her blue Plymouth Barracuda, where she involves herself in each town's mysterious crimes. It stars Natasha Lyonne. After roles in Dennis the Menace and Everyone Says I Love You, she had a breakthrough with Slums of Beverly Hills. She's currently pulling streaming double duty with lead roles in Russian Doll on Netflix and this series. Each episode has guest stars including Adrian Brody, Ron Perlman, John Ratzenberger, Chloe Sevigny, Ellen Barkin, Tim Meadows, and Esapatha Murkison. Now, I'll admit I initially had mixed feelings about the series, because from the interviews and articles I read, it made the show out to be like Columbo and Murder, She Wrote, two shows I reviewed in the Matt Watch That and Matt Forgot That podcasts, and really enjoyed. And as a recent watcher of both, I'm not seeing the connection, which is disappointing because those shows are classics. This one, eh, the, the jury's out. 
That's not to say it isn't good. It's just not what I was expecting. It's like going into a horror movie and it turns out to be a comedy. You had your mind set on one thing and it became another. I do think Natasha Leone is great. She has a very interesting face, and watching it, putting all the puzzle pieces together, is really fascinating. It took me a while to get through the series, but I'm glad I did, because there's definitely some good stuff in it. I don't know, what does everyone think out there? Hit me up on social, let me know. Poker Face has been on for one season, 10 episodes from 2023 to present. The series was renewed for a second season, and streams on Peacock. That's all for this edition of Matt Watch That. Thanks for listening to me babble. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed, or suggestions as to what movie or TV pilot I should see, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Head over to MattSaroski.com for the latest news and updates, and come back next time for the reviews, rants, and randomness. Member of the Crickets with Bobby Holly. Bob- Bobby Holly. That's a good one. And watching it, putting all the pieces... Pieces. It was nominated for 82 Primetime Emmy Awards, winning 85. That, that's an impressive feat. Now what you'll notice is that he uses the upper hand... Upper hand? Come on. She was nominated for Best Actress in a Leading Role Academy Award for a cop... For a something...